As we start another work week, we welcome you to our daily coronavirus virtual town hall. Sometime we set aside to answer your questions. Good afternoon. I'm Mary Ellis Stemler and I'm Michael Wooten ahead for us today. We tackle the following. How many patients are in our local hospitals? Will elective surgeries return soon? Plus unemployment and stimulus issues. So there is a lot to get to and let's start though with something that is really front and center in the news right now. Contact tracing. Public health workers identify infected people, isolate them, and then track down everyone they've been in contact with to get those people tested and into quarantine. Contact tracing will be key once the economy begins to open up more. Uh, we've been talking about this a lot over the past few days. I asked Erie County Health Commissioner Dr. Gail Burstein if her department has enough staff right now to be able to do contact tracing on a large scale. We have a, a cadre of nurses and uh, and uh, other like EMTs and and uh, other um, health educators, disease investigators, whole whole bunch of uh, staff, um, have people from uh, you know social services and um, you know our, uh, actually some some colleagues of mine, some physicians that are retired or semi-retired have um, come back to to volunteer. So we have a cadre of people. That are uh, are volunteering to, and um, in you know we have a lot of people that are that are working up out there and uh, we have room to expand and um, you know we're monitoring uh, where we are with the number of positive cases that we have to uh, investigate and, uh, and and contact those contacts that we've identified so uh, so yeah this is a big operation it's all hands on deck and uh, and we do anticipate. Um, growing those people that are working on 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 this in, um, in very important part of our our um, response to the to the outbreak and uh, you know we right now um, you know we're okay and uh, we have you know plans to expand that when we need to but we're keeping a close eye on that so you are right this is um, a, a huge effort and it's going to grow. And, um, you know, again, with the county, we're prepared, like we've done this before and we just, you know, need to expand what we're doing now as the numbers expand. Well, as a doctor explained, Michael, it is a huge effort to be mm -hmm. able to interview people and find out everyone that they've had contact with. And maybe you've read this as well, but Google and Apple are working together on coming up with an app something yeah. that you can download on your phone and then automatically that data will be sent to some central bank to keep track of who you come in contact with. Yeah, if you think back to when all of this started, we were getting these daily updates from Dr. Burstein and the county executive mm -hmm. where they were saying specific places, you know, someone was at this grocery store at this date. Um, there's going to be a little more of that, maybe not so much to the public, but that contact tracing is really going to start heating back up as we get uh, closer to opening up the economy. Yeah, it's another tool to kind of, yep. you know, get a hold of things and part of our new normal going <laughs> forward, really. Well, this next question we got over the weekend. Here it is. If we have yet to hit our peak in Western New York, how full are the hospitals right now? Well, we reached out to all three major hospital systems in the Buffalo area to get those numbers. Yeah, Catholic Health has the most COVID-19 patients right now, 97 at the treatment facility that's set up at St. Joseph Campus Hospital. Remember, the capacity there is about 120. Catholic Health also has 18 patients across all of its other four hospitals. Uh, as of today, ECMC has 39. COVID positive patients plus another 10 that are awaiting test results. The capacity there is 62 ICU beds. And then as of last night, Kaleida told us the following information as far as confirmed patients at its hospitals, 46 at Buffalo General, 23 at Millard Fillmore Suburban, and then one at Oshai Children's Hospital. Now these are all confirmed numbers. Uh, there are dozens of other people awaiting test results. Now that ups, add, adds up rather to 224 patients in hospitals, but remember a lot more are in nursing homes and Catholic Health also has 15 in its St. Joseph Post Acute Center, which was set up to move patients out of the hospital intensive care unit and to free up space. Yeah, I think this just kind of gives everybody a sense of you know, the numbers, how many people are in hospitals, which hospitals uh, are the busiest right now. And again, we're seeing some of these hospitalization rates going up, suggesting we have not hit our peak here in Western New York. That is the big takeaway because our local health system isn't overwhelmed. That's a great thing. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that people aren't still coming into the hospital every day. They are. That's why, as you said, Michael, 
everyone is reminding us, the, the public health officials, that we're not at that peak, we're not out of the woods, we have not turned that corner yet. Yeah, the discharge number is also growing. More right. and more people going to the hospital, very, very sick, but getting better, so that's good. There you go. Well, also on the issue of hospitals, on Friday, we showed you a letter that the Healthcare Association of New York State sent to the governor urging him to consider allowing some hospitals to go back to doing elective and non-emergency surgeries and other procedures. The governor got asked about that. And so we sort of got an answer to the following question from one of our viewers. This is the same question we showed you on Friday. It's just timely again. The person asked, when can we expect surgeries can be scheduled again in hospitals? Well, turns out we're going to know more tomorrow, according to what the governor said today. Watch. They're saying, can't we, we have lower vacancy. Uh, we don't need those beds for New York City people or Buffalo people or anyone else. Why not let us start going back to elective surgery if we don't need the capacity? That is a good question, and we're going to look at, we are, have been looking at that. It's again a little question of balance and the valve and the dial. You let them go do elective surgery. They fill up the beds with elective surgery then what happens if you have a, uh, a need for those beds because of the coronavirus and you don't have the bed because someone is uh, doing some form of elective surgery? That's the balance. Uh, that we're going to announce tomorrow, a policy that we believe uh, uh, provides for that and has some variables that take the coronavirus rate in that region and compares it to the vacancy rate in that region and a potential for a high point in that region. And uh, we'll announce that tomorrow. So we'll look forward to how that all plays out. But, you know, we just showed you the numbers of how many patients there are right now in our local hospitals. There is certainly a capacity there and untapped resource as far as open ICU beds and other surge med beds and other um, other options. But we haven't hit the peak yet. And so there are so many factors that go into all of this. And the last thing you want to do is have people using these beds for non-essential, non-emergency things. And then all of a sudden you need them for this pandemic. True, but at the same time, I think it's encouraging to hear the governor say that they are going to consider it because there are elective surgeries that are done on an outpatient basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to book a surgery suite and you have to have staff, you know, in recovery, et cetera. But that is something where you're not taking up a bed for days and days. You know, it's an in and out sort of thing. Maybe that type of procedure is something that the governor is willing to allow. And you, you hear, you know, elective surgery, that's true in some cases, but it may also be true that you need to do it relatively soon. You can right. only put off this stuff for so long. So yeah. we will, of course, let you know what happens on that tomorrow. Uh, we told you first at five how New York State is doing antibody tests on 3,000 people now across New York to see how much of the population has had the virus and may now be immune. Now that includes Western New Yorkers, part of this study who got tested at some Wegmans locations. Uh, one viewer texted us this question. How does just testing 3000 people tell us anything about how many people have survived COVID-19 and when will everyone be able to get this type of test, the antibody test? Well, unfortunately, we don't know the answer to the second half of that question, but Dr. John Torres with NBC News did explain today how that 3000 person sample will help experts better understand the spread of the virus. There's no feasible way to test every person in the U.S., so this method of random sampling is a way for researchers to understand the spread of the virus in a community and apply that to the population at large. The New York governor's office says they expect to have results at the end of this week. So I think the takeaway here is that this is a scientific method. This yes. just isn't a willy nilly. Let's just, oh, I don't know, choose 3000 people. And it's used all the time in science, whether you're talking about the FDA approving a product and wanting to test whether or not it's safe. You know, again, you can't test every single person in a population. You have to use the science and the mathematics to come up with a good sample. A representative sample, absolutely. So we'll look forward to that later in the week, get those results, that'll be big. Uh, we continue to get a lot of unemployment questions, and here is one that someone named Carol emailed to us. It's a little long, but I think it's important. She said, I hate to bother you, but I'm at my wits end. I started my unemployment application on March 16th. Like many others, I completed half the application and had to call to complete the other half. 
did that for four weeks straight, sometimes three to four hours nonstop to no avail. When they put up the new website, I signed up right away, received a confirmation that they received the application, followed by a phone call saying they would contact me within 72 hours. That was last Friday. It's now 216 hours and I'm still waiting. I'm going on my sixth week with no money. Mm. Is there anything you can do? Is this the norm? As I know they keep saying, be patient, please advise. There are a lot of people in Carol's situation. They're partway through this process and stuck at something and wondering what in the world can they do? Well, we reached out to the State Department of Labor to ask about this. What are people supposed to do if they're stuck at part of the process? Who can they call or email or whatever? Well, we got a lengthy statement laying out a lot of the changes, but at this point, it does not appear that there is a way for applicants to ask questions. We keep asking about that. And on another unemployment issue, the secretary to the governor also gave this update today. There was this incredibly inefficient, frankly stupid process that the federal government laid out around pandemic unemployment insurance where if you were a gig worker, if you were self-employed, if you were a contractor, you had to apply for unemployment insurance, get denied, and then go through the process, a second process of employing for pandemic unemployment insurance. And what the Department of Labor came up with was a new form that was launched this morning where you can now fill out one application, put in all of the information, and the Department of Labor determines if you are not um, able to get regular unemployment insurance, it will automatically put you into the pandemic unemployment insurance. So you don't have to wait, get rejected, reapply. So that should hopefully streamline for those people who I know have been really struggling to get their money faster.